thank you so much for being here, first of all. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, you were the first African-American woman to fly the U-2. And just for listeners at home, to get an idea of what the U-2 is, um, the U-2 is an American single jet engine aircraft. It's in high altitude reconnaissance aircraft. It's flown by the, the Air Force and the CIA at the very edge of space. Um, and it provides real-time imagery and electronic monitoring of enemy territory. That's pretty, uh, really good. I mean, the CIA, it started under the CIA program in 1955, but the Air Force took it over. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't remember the year, um, but man, uh, you are well-versed. <laughs> Very well, good. Um, and so even though it's, uh, you know, activities are classified, I think it's reasonable to think that there's a U-2 right now over Eastern Europe um, surveilling the Russian invasion in Ukraine. So I, I've I've said this before. Um, the U two has flown for about sixty seven years. I think this year is the sixty seventh. And in six decades, over six decades, it's flown in all the hot spots. I am not a person that is current in the aircraft or in the military. I retired five years, almost yeah, five years. So the U two, from what I know, has flown in every type of hot spot situation. Right. So would this be any different? Maybe. I mean, we have more aircraft, more drones, but you right. could decide for yourself. Right. And so let's talk about being at 70,000 feet. What does that feel like? When you did that for the very first time, what did it feel like? The very first time I, I did it was after my solo flight, my uh, initial solo. And uh, man, it was, it was pretty amazing. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm breathing pretty heavy. So because of that, uh, the canopy in my area was very fogged up because I was just... <laughs> so you, could... <laughs> you basically missed all flight. <laughs> no, no, no. But I was, um, you know, because you're in the, the pressure suit for the first time mm -hmm. and you're going up with your, your instructor and, uh, you know, you're just breathing fast. It's funny because uh, the oxygen system, there is an oxygen consumption warning light if you're consuming too much oxygen. And sometimes when you're getting excited about something, it'll go off on the ground. And it did that for me because I was just so pumped, so right. pumped, so oh, excited, God. so everything. So uh, I was just breathing hard. As you get above, you know, 45,000 and you're doing all your checklists and, you know, you're talking to the instructor and you're getting above 50, you know, you start the day that we were, we flew, it was a pretty clear day except for my cockpit, which is slightly fogging over from me breathing hard. So you start seeing the curvature of the earth. And at what, at what altitude is that, like 52,000 feet? Um, above 15? 50, between 50 okay. and 60, you could start seeing it. On a really clear day, you could start just seeing a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was excited because it just got quiet. You're not talking to... You're not talking to uh, air traffic control. You're not talking to any, you're just talking to the instructor. So, you know, you take a moment to just observe what you're seeing and you're seeing the sky getting a little darker. Um, you know, you're running for me. I'm running checklists in my head. I'm making sure I'm not missing anything. But, you know, there were times during that flight I took a moment to go, man, this is uh, this is pretty freaking cool. So and how long does a you know, an average flight lasts? Because I know that in your book, you mentioned that one flight, you came back from one flight that was about 11 hours and you were, you know, dead. <laughs> dead yeah, tired. so so typical flights last over eight hours when you're doing missions. Um, right. And they're typically, we say eight to 12 hours. And so, is there a constant, is there a constant sort of state of alertness or do you have to, do you have moments where you just have time off? You can relax? So, so for us, when I was doing OEF and OIF, uh, there's times when you're transiting in theater uh, mm -hmm. from your location. So you have a little bit of time to do some checklists. Um, you're, you might be talking to people, maybe getting an updated intel brief. But once you're in, in country, for lack of a better term, uh, it's time to get to work. So you're not, you're not goofing right. around. You're trying to maximize the time that you're there to help as many people as possible. And how high is the risk of flying the U-2? compared to flying jets in other combat missions? I can't tell you the comparison. I will tell you that historically uh, it's dangerous. So 
-hmm. ejecting out of the U2, you know, at high altitudes when you're in the pressure suit, it's about a 50-50 chance that you're going to survive. Why is it a 50-50 chance, though? You know, most people on ejection, um, when we've had fatalities, uh, you would, upon ejection, maybe strike some surface of the aircraft, depending on what wow. the configuration of the aircraft's in. So um, it's it's quite dangerous. And, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, right. Yeah. Because so. I I was going to ask you about Bridge of Spies later on, but oh. um, that, <laughs> or and especially that moment with Steven Spielberg in a chase car. But um, <laughs> I was wondering because that um, the scene where uh, Francis Gary Powers is ejected out of his uh, seat is that realistic? So I I had the opportunity to. Um, be like the liaison and be one of the part of the team, the liaison team when DreamWorks came. Mm -hmm. And I got to see some of the the computer graphics work for the modeling of the aircraft as it was falling out of the sky. Mm -hmm. And they used some of the experience from some of the older U2 pilots. And when I mean older, uh, for example, my pilot number 788. So you'll always see that at the end of my like Dragon Lady 788 because that's a, my pilot number. So mm -hmm. the other people who were giving inputs, their pilot number is like 352 okay. or three, three, 300 and something. So they have a lot of experience and they've been in the YouTube program. So they actually saw how the aircraft was modeled to come out of the sky. And they said, you know, based on the information they heard, based on, you know, back in that time, this seems pretty reasonable that this occurred. That's what I could say. And so when he, so he used the ejection seat and survives, um, yes. but can a body, because you said it's a 50-50 chance that you survive, but can a body, um, can it take that rapid change in altitude, even when you're in a pressurized suit? Yeah, so you're ejecting at fast speeds. And remember, the aircraft, the U-2 that was flown back then had a shorter wingspan. So oh, I don't know okay. what that, that rate was. Um, but you're still the seat ejects out too. It's a Martin Baker zero zero ejection seat. So mm -hmm. um, the opening shock, um, as long as you're in a good position when you're getting out, uh, mm -hmm. it's reasonable that you know that's realistic. Right. And do you know at what altitude they you deploy the uh, <clears throat> parachute? Uh, the parachute automatically deploys on ejection. Um, no, it does not. There's a drogue chute that comes out to keep you. When you're up that high, um, mm -hmm. basically you're going to start spinning. So there's a drogue mm -hmm. chute that kind of stabilizes you. And the theory is, is that if my memory serves me correct, you're going face first towards the earth in the, in the seat that's oh. ejected out. So the drogue chute kind of stabilizes all that oscillations after ejection. And when do you lose the seat? Oh boy, you're asking me dash one <laughs> questions. Wow, I wasn't, I this wasn't, is. I, um, was, I wasn't going to ask you this. Yeah, so uh, seat separation. <laughs> Nerding out. <laughs> you you could do a manual. You could do a manual seat separation, but I think seat separation occurs somewhere between. Okay, YouTube community, don't judge me. Again, I'm pulling this memory <laughs> about about fifteen, either thirteen to fifteen thousand feet. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. And <clears throat> were you ever afraid of the enemy in action? No. No, no. Um, that's you know that's it's my job. I signed up for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would say the enemy at that time when I was in in the Middle East, mm -hmm. you knew if you were on the ground, um, you just had you came to that you know the thought that yeah if you get captured uh, bad things will happen so. Right. Um, but I'm not afraid about that because I'm I'm serving my country in the capacity that I volunteered for. So I was I'm proud to do that, proud to serve, and yeah, no fear, no fear about that. Because you also <clears throat> mentioned in your book that you wouldn't mind dying while flying the U two, right? Does that come from patriotism or the will to do your job well, or the fact that you really wanted to fly the U two? What fueled so that? So what fueled that is, first of all, you know, the, some people pay the ultimate sacrifice to their country uh, as a as a person serving for the military, and mm -hmm. and I'm fine with that. I signed up for that, and I, I truly believe in fighting for what my country represents and believes, and and the goodness that it has. 
right? Um, I also believe in if you're if you die doing something that you truly love, then it was worth it, right? So for me, flying was something I always wanted to do. I wanted to be an astronaut. I'm in a pressure suit. Um, I'm flying these amazing missions. I'm serving my country. I'm doing all these things. If something happened and I happened to, you know, die because of this and the afterlife, I'll be cool. <laughs> like, like I'd be like, yeah. I like that answer awesome. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so as much as the U2, you know, loves to be at high altitudes, it really doesn't love to land. It's um, supposed no. to be one of the, I think it's one of the most difficult uh, aircraft to land. And rather than a tricycle landing gear, it has two sets of wheels, one underneath the cockpit, yes. one underneath the engine. Um, and basically after touchdown, it's a balancing act. Right. So it has a bicycle landing gear configuration. So it has a main wheel in the mm -hmm. front, a tail wheel, which is similar to like a big skateboard wheel in the mm -hmm. back. So it's like a, neo a neoprene. Mm -hmm. And you come in, no drift, no crab. Uh, you are correct. The aircraft is probably one of the most challenging aircraft in the Air Force inventory to fly. Mm -hmm. She's called the Dragon Lady for a reason. She's a bear, like, to land this thing. And, you know, after you fly for, you know, eight, ten plus hours, you come back and you you do this great mission and then everyone sees you landing. <laughs> so it has to be on point, right? right? So you don't want to land and then have a crappy landing and damage and it stuff, can happen. One, it happens, right? Because I saw some um, YouTube yeah. videos where you see, you know, um, <clears throat> some pilots, not you, yes. <laughs> landing, landing the YouTube. Well, it, it could be. I won't. I won't tell you. <laughs> we all had the starting right. point. Um, you know, there's. You know, you don't. First of all, you don't want to damage the aircraft. So stalling at a higher altitude, other than two feet, like if you go four or five feet, you can actually break this aircraft pretty severely and damage. Um, the sensors on but the But you aircraft. actually stall, I just want to have the listeners the listeners to know this, you actually yes. stall the aircraft in order to land, right? Yes, you actually run out of airspeed at, and you want to stall the aircraft at two feet. So you want the main gear at two feet as the, air, as the aircraft is running out of air, the nose will mm -hmm. pitch up because it's running out of air. And then tail wheel, you want to land tail wheel mm -hmm. first. Um, slight tailwheel first, and then that's, that's a good day. Awesome. It's not as easy as it sounds. This aircraft, you're putting in inputs into the mm -hmm. yoke because we don't have a stick in the aircraft, mm -hmm. it's a yoke. And it's constant movements. I, I kind of equate it to if you're looking, if you're watching a race car driver inside their uh, yep. car, you see their hands are constantly moving over the wheel, right? It's always constantly adjusting, yep. jerking, back, jerking back and forth. It's the same thing with the mm. U2. You're constantly putting in putting in and taking out inputs and reacting very quickly. So uh, there's a couple of good videos on YouTube where you can see the inside of the cockpit as the pilot's landing. Okay. And uh, yeah, you're just constantly flying it. And can you explain the idea of a, or the concept of a chase car? Yes, the chase car is, um, you know, it's basically the wingman on the ground. So there's another pilot in the chase car. The chase car follows the U2 down the runway. And what they're doing is they're providing calls for the pilot because when you're coming in with the helmet and the pressure suit on and you don't, uh, the visual cues to land, stall at two feet, straight and level, no drift, no crab, it can be a little challenging at times. So you have a chase car in the back that's giving you altitude calls. So we learn to trust this uh we call them the mobile, and we call the aircraft the mobile. So the pilot that sits in there is, is a mobile. And, and it's a YouTube pilot. They'll give you the it's call. It's a YouTube pilot, right? It's like another YouTube it. pilot. So uh, they'll give you calls. Uh, they'll be with you during engines uh, startup and shutdown. Mm -hmm. uh, the mobile is the one who actually pre-flights the aircraft because you can't pre-flight in a mm -hmm. pressure suit. So he does all that stuff for you. He sets up the cockpit for you. Mm -hmm. uh, he or she sets up the cockpit mm -hmm. for you. And then... They follow your mission throughout the whole, and they if there's an emergency, they're the ones that talk to you and kind of help right. you out. What is the one main skill that you need to land the aircraft? You have to be accurate and consistent and calm under pressure and be able to identify when things are going wrong quickly. I always tell people that the U-2 is the slowest plane to kill you quicker than any other aircraft if you underestimate it. Because it... In the, you know, in the pattern, 
you know, you're maybe doing 90 knots, you're coming in an approach, you're doing 90, 90? knots, and you're slowing down. Oh, my 90, God, 90. 90. Oh, zero. Wow. That's slow. Yeah, yeah. So it's really slow. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah, it's like <laughs> a little higher. It's, it's like Cessna. Like it's, which <laughs> well, a little higher. It's Cessna yeah. slow. Okay. Wow, oh, my God. Yeah, it's Cessna <laughs> slow, but... But it's huge. It is a handful of aircraft, oh and um, especially for like no flap landings, because you're coming in very shallow. You're coming in a little faster, and for every knot that you're off, like in the no flap landing, you can you can actually float down the runway another thousand mm. feet. So you have to be accurate, consistent, and you have to your skills have to be on right. point. So it's not. That's why the U two has an interview process because the aircraft is not for everyone. And there are some guys who will come there, interview, and, and just not perform well. And it, there's, it's no dig on them. It's just that the aircraft is just that right. different. And you mentioned that yeah. in your book that you're, so you're very relaxed. We can see it now already, but you're very relaxed in your own skin, right? So in your book, you describe that part of the first... <laughs> You're like, yeah, um, part of the <laughs> part of the um, first test that you had to do for the U2 qualification is to spend an hour alone in a room in the pressurized suit. Um, and that's a very claustrophobic experience to many. Right. But for you, you just chilled yes. out and fell asleep. Where where oh, yeah. do you think that that comfort like within yourself comes from? Where does that come from? Um, maybe I'm a little not quite right. That's what I call a community because <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be a little crazy to want to do it. You know, I mean, I don't look, I, I was, I'm an only child. I That's know how to play with, I, <laughs> that I, I didn't, I was, almost said something that was going to be totally taken out of oh. context. I'm an only child. I'm a latchkey kid. I know how to entertain myself. Mm -hmm. I know how to, I know how to hang out by myself. Some people find it hard to be alone in their own thoughts right. and with themselves, especially I suspect when COVID started and people were shut down and now you have to spend more time with yourself. I think people really had a hard time dealing yeah, with people that. are freaking out. Yeah. People freaked out. Um, a lot of mental health things were exposed. Mm -hmm. um, people were uncomfortable, but for me, I enjoy, look, I enjoy chilling with myself and I'll be like, you know, talking to myself like, yo, what's up? You know, not, you know, I, I, I can entertain myself and be totally comfortable with me and who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that was something, you know, as a kid being made fun of and being an only child and all these things that equipped me to do that. So being alone in a pressure suit, hearing myself breathe, not that, that bad. was no big deal. <laughs> Nice. Not that bad. Um, so to go back to the landing, um, you were, and I mentioned before, you were in one of the chase cars with Steven Spielberg while shooting Bridge of Spies. What was that like? Yes. Steven Spielberg is an amazing, uh, brilliant person. Like you could just, it, it was interesting in the two days that he was there to do these final shoots, hmm. to see him in action and to see how down to earth he was with people. But then to see him behind the camera when they did a shot, and I remember one at one point we got a shot of just the wheels moving along the runway and he was staring at it and he was staring at it maybe a little too long. And I was like, what are you like in my mind? I'm like, what you, what are you doing? And I came up behind him and I was like, I said, sir, uh, I said, you're looking at the shot for a long time. You know, why, you know, what's the why behind this? And he basically said in the, in the theaters, people will get that sensation of the ground rush as the wheels are going, you know, going down the runway. So they could get that sensation that they too are in the aircraft. Mm. And I just didn't say it. I looked at him like, oh. Yeah, that's that level of precision wow. that makes him brilliant. Yeah, so I mean, he's he's brilliant in his craft. He's he's done things. He's he's set the mold for a lot of stuff, but it was it was I don't know, it was just special for me to get a little peek behind the man and why he makes his decisions to know his why. And I thought that was, that was pretty cool. And he, he was just, he loves military folks. So he was just very open and very approachable. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was interesting because at the end of the shoot, uh, it was at, it was at the end of December. So it was his birthday. And so we decided to get him a military sheet cake, like just mm -hmm. a, plain old cake that you get from the commissary and he loved it like he enjoyed it and it was just like it was really awesome 
So he he kind of hung out and it, it was nice. it was cool. And didn't you at some point ask him, I thought that was quite funny, to tell him not to get out of the car? What was that about? I did. <laughs> I did. It was one of my most awkward <laughs> moments in life. Right. So we, we were doing the shoot and I was in the car as a safety advisor because the mobile, there was another mobile. We had briefed this pretty thoroughly because I, I was given the, the wing commander trusted me very much. And I really appreciate that. So we were doing a lot of things that were non-standard, but within rules, within AFI, but part of it, Spielberg wanted to be on the runway. So I was in another car and as we were going out to take off, because it was actually a gentleman who's doing a training flight, the mobile uh, something was wrong with his camera. And he said, Meryl, can you mobile the aircraft? And I said, okay, no problem. So the aircraft took off. And once Spielberg saw it, he's like, okay, I'm ready to go to the next shot because it's ready. And I'm like, as a mobile, okay. I can't leave the aircraft right. in the pattern. And I said, sir, I can't do it. And he's like, well, I'll just get up and walk. <laughs> and um, I said, so you can't just walk across the runway like that uh, security, security come in and jack you. And I'm like, uh, sir, you, you can't get out. It's it's only going to be 90 seconds till he lands. And it was silence in the car. So it was me, him, Spielberg, and then the actor, the main actor. I forgot his name, Austin. I forgot his last name. So we're all, I'm sitting there like this. Yeah, he probably, he probably like, doesn't hear that very often. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, oh. I was like, oh. I was like, so awkward. I was like, Spielberg hates me now. So the aircraft's coming around. I'm talking I'm like, sir, it'll be, it'll be done soon. And then my friend comes out cause he's, re- he's the mobile. He's coming back. He's like, Meryl, I got it. And I'm like, great. And he's like to the chase. And I'm like, no. Cause when you say to the chase, now both cars have to go down. And the this runway. is with 140 miles per hour. We right? did. Yeah. We, so <laughs> we did, we probably did. I, I'll say probably about one ten. Okay. So <laughs> the, the aircraft, the aircraft comes mm-hmm. down, the mobile's chasing. I'm chasing behind the mobile, but I'm really, really tight. I mean, we're tight because we're getting right. shots for the military was still safe <laughs> and really tight. So Spielberg takes out his camera and he's just filming. He's not saying anything. In my mind, I'm like, this guy still hates me. And when we're done, we get off the runway and he goes, that was awesome. Like he was like, he was like a little kid. He was like, Oh man, Meryl, I'm so glad you had me in the, the car. This was great. I'm gonna do this. He's like, I'm gonna send this to Michael Bay. And I'm like, it went from awkward to great. Went from awkward to cool in like <laughs> two nice. seconds. Yeah. And so with more um, different topic, with more satellite technology, what is the future you think of human piloted aircraft? I mean, I think you there's gonna be some aircraft that you're always gonna want to have a human in the cockpit, right? So you're not going to want to transport people. I, I think at this stage, we're not ready for that where there's no one in the front mm-hmm. cockpit, right? So, you know, maybe with cargo, that's a different right. story. But with people, um, I think it would be unnerving for a lot of people to no see one no one up there, up right. there because cause no one has skin in the mm, game, yes, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> if something happens. So I think a lot of things, there'll be a consideration for unmanned. Um, But as we do this transition, there's going to be both of them and there's going to be pros and cons. So, you know, it's great to have a YouTube pilot in the aircraft because uh, dynamic tasking, they're talking to people on the ground, Mm -hmm. you get a a flavor, whereas, but you go into permissive environments that you could go to, but non-permissive environments where you don't want to lose a person you've invested so much money in, you'd probably go unmanned. So, I think there's going to be, there's just going to be a A mixture and a flavor. Yeah, there's going to be a hybrid system and there's going to be, you know, going to work off each other and have these synergies. You said that in action, you never really felt fear. Did you, during your flying career, ever feel fear? Like flying aerobatics of maneuvers or solo flights or? I think the only time I felt fear was the helicopter incident where we almost went in the water. And and that was that was one where can you explain that quickly it was, because I know what you're talking about because I read your book but um, the listeners might not. It was one of my first uh, missions as a training missions as a helicopter second pilot when I was flying in the Navy, 
And I was flying with an aircraft commander, and we were flying and nights. S- and was we that SH sixty B? Yeah, SH yeah. sixty Bravo. So this was uh, Lamps aircraft. Um, it was uh, yeah, Lamps uh, light airborne multi- multi-purpose system. So we did anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare. We had torpedoes. It was a plug-and-play type mm-hmm. of helicopter. That night we were uh, doing some training off the coast of Virginia with the George Washington Battle Group during our what we call JTFX cycle. It's right before you go on a long cruise deployment. And it was late at night and we're looking for a sub. We know the sub is below us, but part of the training is that we had to actually ID it and drop a, I think, uh, not drop a flare, maybe uh, maybe drop a chem light, a flare or something. We had tracked the sub down, we knew where it was. At that, at that time, we were restricted to going below 200 feet at night because about a month prior, there was a mishap where they went below 200 feet and went into the water. So we wanted to win the game and win this training. You know, we knew where the sub was. So we all agreed that we would actually do what's called a coupled approach. You could do an actual automatic approach. The aircraft could fly below 200 feet to 50 mm-hmm. feet. And we should be able to see it because it was pitch black, no moon. So we decided to do that. And I was a helicopter second pilot. I was new. I was slow in getting the checklist out. My head was buried in the cockpit trying to find it. My aircraft commander was frustrated with me. And he started a manual descent below 200 feet without telling myself or the crew member in the back. The crew member was sitting outside the... um, outside the doors looking over the side. So he was tethered into the aircraft, but he was still out of his seat. And for some reason, the helicopter just kind of, just, I don't know, there was a bump or something. And it made me look up at uh, the rat out, which is uh, the indicator when you're down low. And we were descending through 20 feet and not climbing. So, I yelled power and I uh, grabbed the collective and I pulled like an armpit, like I pulled for dear life because that's what it was. The air crew member didn't know what was happening because it was pitch black. He looked inside and I remember when we talked the next day, he said we were at six feet. Six feet. So, (sighs) six feet. So, um, you know, it was all our faults. We shouldn't have agreed to do it. Um, I put too much trust in the aircraft commander being a helicopter second pilot, and that's something I didn't do mm-hmm. again. I think at that moment, the cockpit was silent. I'll tell you, we didn't debrief it because I think we were still in shock. We flew the rest of the mission, but it was just one of those, you know, that's that's a day you get in your rack at the end of the day, and you're like, wow, this could have ended a lot worse. But, and, then, and then dealing um, with that fear, like what made you go back up? It wasn't fear. It was just like, it was dumb. It, you know, it was, it, it's one of those, hey, I made a stupid thing and I survived that. Let's not do that again. So a fear in the sense of at that moment when I saw 20 feet, it was, uh, I, can I curse on this yeah, podcast sure. or no? <laughs> it it, it, it was, it was, it was straight up that, oh shit factor. Right. right. So that's what the fear was like, oh dude, we're, we're in trouble. We're, we're going right. down. And and at the end, it was more, this is a lesson learned. We didn't really talk about it. I think in today's, you know, me being a little older and stuff, we would have we would have talked about it. Right. We would have debriefed it. We did, did all these things. But at that time, I mean, I think we were just too much in shock to say anything because the air crew member in the back was mm-hmm. new. Um, I was, I was, you know, he was relatively new. I was relatively new in the aircraft commander. I, he, you know. You just it, let it, let it go. <laughs> We let it go. <laughs> okay. And I think another thing that you are very good at is um, preparing and preparation because I think that's a big aspect of, or was a big aspect and still is a big aspect of your career. And I'm going to quote something from your book directly. Um, it's easy to become complacent in an aircraft. You can never let yourself assume that everything will be okay. You train the same way all the time, do things over and over, that when something is out of the ordinary, you get this feeling that something is not right. And so that has to do with preparation and doing something over and over. How important is it for you and how do you prepare? Like I want to get into your brain a little bit because you've flown on the highest level. How do you prepare for, for example, a check ride? Or how do you study? What 
What is your process? Say I have a, a speech or something. Yeah. Um, I'll have some idea of what I want it to be and what I want people to get out of it. And then I will write some things down and I will start to go over the story in my head and start talking about it. I'll, I'll start walking around and talking about the story. And the reason why is because um, I, I, want it to, I want it to sound smooth. I want it to be smooth. I don't want to be... I don't want to feel like I'm under duress if I'm doing something. So in an aircraft, you know, you train, you know, the old adage, you train like you fight, you fight like you train. Um, repetition is key to just being calm under pressure when things go wrong and having, and as you're doing it, as you're doing it over and over, you say, I start putting in my mind, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? I start thinking of other branches and sequels that may happen during that event. And I can, um, for lack of a better term, role play in my head how I'm going to deal hmm. with that. Uh, it's, I think it's something that's served me well. I think in the military, they kind of hammered it in more. But even when I was younger... To do well in math, you had to do math problems over and over right. again. So that when the test came, the general premise was the same, but the numbers might be different, but you can't get freaked out about that. If you understand the premise and the why mm -hmm. you're doing it, then whatever they throw at you, it should be okay. Right. You know, it, your reasoning skills will be okay. And, and I would dial that back to, as a kid growing up, I liked going through places that were mazes and going through them over and over mm. again. Why? Because suppose I had to run down this hall for a reason. I just wanted to know what every nook and cranny held because it was just a curiosity point for me. And it was something that the more I knew, the easier the challenge. But if it's something unknown, then I'm ready for it because I've seen a lot of this before. So nothing should really surprise right. me. I, I'm not saying I don't like to be surprised, but I like to be prepared. And I, you know, if I'm not prepared, I get really pissed off at myself about it. Like I get annoyed right. about it. Like I could have did this better. I could have did that better. So I'm pretty hard on myself about those things. So I, I just. I think it's also an interesting thing because I talked to Tammy Jo Schultz and she's a, she was a Navy fighter fighter pilot and then with um, Matan Gavish and he's a uh, um, Krav Maga expert who trained the NYPD and Israeli special forces and what they both said and I hear you say the same thing is that when there's a moment that causes adrenaline like when you're in the moment the adrenaline is not going to teach you anything new right it's either going to speed up what you already know or put you on high alert or if you don't really know your shit well it can freeze you Right, you can go into a freeze. So it's this kind of idea of repetition so that when you're in the moment, you can perform. Yes, so you know, I've done martial arts for about 30 yeah. years and I remember um, one of the forms I did for quite a few years was Wing Chun. And my instructor used to say, we practice this so it comes out like a sneeze. <laughs> it's something you naturally do. Right. But that's a it's, good one. <laughs> you know, instead of that, it's a, it's a block and a punch. So you're like punching or doing, you know, something in that. And that's how we train. Uh. We train so each movement was as fluid as breathing air. Mm. And if something disrupted that, you, it was just a minor inconvenience. It didn't freak you out. You just continued to go mm. with the flow. So uh, I'm going yeah. to use that expression. <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah, like yeah, a I think sneeze. It's, like... it's a great expression, actually. <laughs> a great thing to say. So in one of the final chapters of your book, you talk about um, what it's like to return to civilian life after serving in the military for such yes. a long time. I thought of an interview that I heard with Yeonmi Park, and she is this North Korean defector. Um, she fled North Korea and the communist regime when she was 13. And she talks about how when she came to America after fleeing, you know, she went through China and then, sorry, China, uh, North, South Korea, China, and then the United States. And she talked about what it was like to see American women talk about, you know, or cry about their boyfriends leaving them, right? Whereas she was used to seeing bodies piled up in the street, like d dead bodies piled up in the street. You know, there's a disconnect to what people find important. 
Yes. So, I mean, first of all, defecting from North Korea, <laughs> uh, amazing. Yeah. I mean, I read um, Tears of My Soul uh, about the uh, the one woman who was responsible for the bombing in, in 1980s, uh, the South Korean flight. Anyway, so it was interesting reading her leaving North mm. Korea military and coming to South Korea. Um, yeah, there is leaving the military. You just there's just, it's this it's this world of you know somewhat it's discipline. It's knowing your roles. It's you know focusing on mission things, and you come to the civilian world where people are focused on yeah just really maybe what their kids are doing uh i started working as a personal trainer so people were really there was drama in the workplace about really insignificant things in my opinion right not life or death or not you know i came from the pentagon my last tour and there were just a lot of things going on policy and making sure and interacting with people that were trying to do all this policy and you were coordinating with people. And now I, I just didn't understand why it was so important to get so upset about certain right. things. And, uh, and then I also didn't understand why was it not important for you to show up on time because it's a very simple thing to do. <laughs> or <laughs> not for some people. <laughs> <laughs> so um I I think I I still struggle with that now but a lot right, less. I was just going to ask you does that disconnect change over time? It it does and it's hard, you know, you try not to get caught up in it and you try to I try to still toe the line, but I know one of my clients, um my one of my clients Ned, he's uh 78 years old. He's been one of my longest clients. He he, has, he does boxing with me only. Mm. Sometimes he'll say, oh, you're becoming more c civilianized. And I'll like <laughs> tell him, Sh I'll say to him, shut your mouth. And like, cause he'll be like, oh, you're co you're becoming softer now that you're out in the civilian world. Like he, he always like jabs right. at me. Um, but he's, he's a retired judge and lawyer. So he lived in that world where really being disciplined and doing things are very important. Right. So him and I, we, we have this understanding and this camaraderie. Mm -hmm. A lot of. Uh, I find now, especially after COVID, a lot of people, at least in America and in the circle that I am, seem to be focused maybe on the wrong things. Right. There's a lot of things going on in the world. And I think a lot of people are scared. Um, they're putting blinders on. They're becoming complacent. And now is not the time to do that, quite frankly. Right. And um, it worries me a little bit because I have a friend that's going through you know, yeah, chemo, which stuff. is that's the important stuff like supporting her and and shaving my head that's the yeah, important stuff i mean stuff. kudos it's, it's not that john yes johnny has a swim practice and blah 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 no nah, just yeah yeah as as we say in the military shut your pie hole no your one wants to hear hole. that i wonder where that come from pie hole what's a pie yeah. hole because you eat pie with your mouth. So oh, you that's why it. the pie comes in too. Got it. <laughs> yeah. English as a second language. <laughs> it's like pie. Hole? Is there a hole um, in the pie? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. It's um your pie. Your pie hole is your mouth because you eat pie. Like if someone says shut your soup cooler, because you blow in soup. Oh. Oh yeah. Oh. So okay. Shut soup your cooler. Got it. Soup cooler. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. Great. All these uh, very useful terms I'm learning right now. Okay. And so you're a trainer now, personal trainer, um, and you were inspired. Right. I really like this story about how you got inspired to do it. You were inspired to do fitness um, at 70,000 feet while flying the U2 when you were reading this interview with Jack, Jack LaLanne. LaLanne in the Playgirl. <laughs> was that really, was yes. that really the moment that you were first interested in being a trainer? I would say that it's one of those moments where it's it started making sense to me. So I, I was up at altitude at the end of um, finishing up the mission and I had some downtime. And we sometimes we have reading material in there when we have transits where it's dead mm -hmm. time. And I was I was reading the Playgirl <laughs> story about the Playgirl. My mom sent me Playgirls uh, when she was alive. And the reason why is because as a female working in a very male dominated 
area, I mean, guys are guys, and you know, they like their they like their porn. Mm. However, as a heterosexual, I don't like their porn. <laughs> so I used to complain about that, and and my and I was like, hey mom, can you send me a Playgirl? And on my first deployment, she sent mm. it to me. So when it came in the mail, I was all excited, and I and I showed to it them. to the guys on the boat, and they wanted nothing okay. to do with it. And I'm like. That's and how they, I feel yeah, about and they you. they learned how to never <laughs> show you the play, Playboy ever again. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes. And um, so that became a thing between me and my mom. So on this particular uh, mission, I had one, and I and it was new. So I started reading about it. It was Jack Lane, And it was an article, article about him and his life. And he's done amazing things. I mean, he's motivational. He was motivational in his 90s, late 90s, mm. right? Him and his wife working out, he was still doing pull-ups. And I was like, man, this guy's really mm. cool. And so, yeah, that really, part of that kind of inspired me because everyone in the military is eventually gonna get out. You're gonna hit higher tenure, you're gonna wanna do something mm. different. So why not, you know, mentorship was very important in my life. Why not look at training as a, a form or a conduit to mentor people? Mm and help people with fitness and help people. Uh, what I learned when I do fitness or when I do martial arts or when I work out, you know, you get tired, but you, you know, you, uh, it's kind of a meditation right. for me. Stop right? thinking. Yeah, you become a little bit more vulnerable. And with people like that, when you work out with them and you're able to help them, it, the communication becomes more intimate. They're more vulnerable. And then you can actually see not only are you changing them physically, but you're also changing their mindset and doing things for them and, and having them have a different right. outlook. So I, I think that's a win-win. And, you know, that's really why I do it. I mean, that's why I'm certified. That's why uh, I train at the gym. And, you know, I train all ages. My youngest has been seven. Mm -hmm. My oldest has been 78. You know, so I, I, I love and it. How, how and good, where can people stuff. train with you? So let's say, let's say if I want to train with you, what do I do? All right, send me an okay. email and and say, hey, I live in the area. So I live in the Sacramento mm -hmm. area. Okay. Where do you live? New York City. Really? What part? <laughs> yes. Um, Greenwich Village. <gasps> I just moved from Midtown to Greenwich Village. Congratulations. How do you like it? Yeah, it's different. Midtown was very corporate. And Greenwich Village is, yes. as the name would suggest, uh, like a village. A lot of dogs. I used to go down there. Yeah, I used to go down a lot when I, growing up, I used to go to this place called Forbidden Planet, which had all the sci-fi oh. stuff. Anyway, so, sorry. You should come over. Yeah. <laughs> Next time I'm in New York, I'm going to, I'll send you an email. Like, oh, I'm coming in. I'll come and see some sci-fi stuff. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, but if, yeah, I live in the Sacramento mm -hmm. area. Uh, I work at a local gym. Give me a call or uh, you could contact me on Instagram. Uh, I'm DragonLady788. On Facebook, Meryl Tangestall. Mm -hmm. On TikTok, Meryl Tangestall. I also have uh, my email address is mt at Meryl mm -hmm. And uh, excellent. I also have a website, Meryl So you can contact me there via okay. uh, and, um, email. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned in your book that your father um, wasn't around much, right? How did you manage to kind of open up for love? I mean, I know this sounds terribly cliche, and I don't mean it that way, but um, and eventually marry marry Chell, right? Yes, your current husband. <laughs> Good, you pronounced that You're, right. Yeah, Chell within Chello within without oh, no. Yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> where, where are you, Chell? Where are you from originally? Mm -hmm. I'm from uh, Amsterdam, oh. Netherlands. Amsterdam yes. is really a nice place. Anyway, yes. okay. So how did that? Is it something you worked on or is it some, is something that just happened? So, I, I mean, you're right. My dad left, but the impression that I had when he left is that he was a man that, um, I don't want to say, uh, I guess he was a man that was a rolling stone at some point. Um, I know he has had other kids. Mm -hmm. And for me... I'm open to love. My whole thing is I just didn't want to be like my dad in terms of having all these extra relationships outside of a relationship. Right. Like if I'm with someone, I'm not trying to cheat on them. I'm not trying to do right. all that. Like my husband, you know, he was a guy that that made life fun. And I and I enjoyed that. He's incredibly smart. 
you know, he's working on his PhD. Mm -hmm. He's he's a hundred pound brain to my twenty five pound brain. So we can have some good conversations. Um, he lives his, you know, he he lives his own career, and he's very confident in what he does, and he's very competent in what mm -hmm. he does. And I enjoy that with someone. Um, with us getting married, you know, to me, from my point of view. The relationship is like my dad was crappy to my mom. I'm not going to do that to someone mm -hmm. else. So, yeah, I, I don't know why it's sometimes I don't understand why it's so hard to be faithful if you are focused on your career and your family and you put the effort mm -hmm. into that. Life is full enough, right? Yeah, it's full. Like, <laughs> dude, I ain't got enough time in the day. These kids wear <laughs> me out. Like, if I had someone, if I had like a side piece, pfft, <laughs> I don't, I, I can't even, I can't juggle. Like, I just right. can't. <laughs> Actually, it's so funny. Sorry. My next question was going to be, how do you manage life juggling <laughs> all these different things? You know, um, work, having a baby, writing a book, uh, being a motivational speaker. How do you juggle these it's, things? Uh, it, it's chaos control. You know, you have to emphasize, like the kids during the day, I, I think I have it set up now where like, in the mornings, the kids go to school, and once they're at school, I'm able to do training, mm -hmm. I'm able to do podcasts, mm -hmm. I'm able to work on uh, me and what I'm, what I'm doing, and what I'm doing with you know, this next phase of my life motivating mm -hmm. people. As soon as school lets out, I mean, it's all about them. It's all about uh, today is swim practice mm -hmm. or swim clinics. Uh, tomorrow, it's piano lessons. You know, we got Monday, Wednesday, Fridays are judo lessons, you know, and then um, my husband comes home at like seven. So, you know, by that time, it's time to get the kids ready for bed. And right. uh, is there a lot of planning involved? There is a lot of planning. There is communication. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my husband and I are good <laughs> at it. And sometimes we are terrible at it. I mean, I'll be honest yeah. with you, uh, but we're we're pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, we deconflict our schedules because he's still in the Navy reserves. Okay. It's a lot of planning and communication. And once, you know, maybe once a month, we're like, okay, what do you got going on for March? What has changed? What's, what do you got going? We go as far out. I think I, our plan has gone as far out right now as October. Cause I have a speaking engagement in October. That's how far out we go. Oh, wow. Okay. And then we plan time. Like, okay, what do we want to take a vacation? Can you get time off? Um, it's 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 constant juggling, but you have to be with a partner who one you could speak to, one who's understanding, one who's supportive, and then you're supportive back. And the kids also need to understand there's transparency with the kids. Like there's some this morning, like uh, my daughter, we all woke up, allergies, everyone's mm -hmm. feeling like garbage, and she's just being cranky. And I'm like, look, we all don't feel well. I said, but you, I said, you can be upset and that's your feeling. But what you cannot do is make everyone else more miserable because you're upset. Right. So you, I was like, you go five minutes in your room and get your life together. Come back out. You come back out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's seven. And I talked to her like, like this, um... but I, yeah, she's like pouting and I'm like, and then, okay. Then she didn't take five. She took like 10 and she came out and she was better attitude. Oh. And I was like, all right, good. I'm like, good job. I said, I know it's hard, but we're going to get through this. Mm -hmm. And, but with kids, you, we, we try to be very transparent with them and what's mm -hmm. going on. So they know when I'm leaving, but they know when my husband's leaving. Um, right. You self-published your book, right? Shattered the Sky. I just want to mention this because I want people to know that you have a book and what it's called and where they can get it. What's the goal behind the book? Like, why did you write the book other than sharing your story? Yeah, so it, it really was about sharing my story and trying to inspire and motivate other people that, especially other young girls that, uh, people in general, but young girls, your origin story, wherever you come from, especially in this country, you have the ability and you can have the resources to be the best version of yourself that right. you can. And... I think a lot of kids in the U.S., especially as 
as COVID was going through, you know, they might not think that. If you're in underserved communities, you might think the only way out is what you see other teenagers doing. And it's not mm. that. There are people out there who can help mentor you. There are people out there that can help put you on a different path. Yeah, and that's why I love America. Right. And I think, and I think uh, sometimes Americans lose sight of that. Like, this is a pretty, regardless, we're not perfect. Right. We have our, our things and our politics and stuff that people don't agree with and our fights and um, racial divides and mm -hmm. all that. But, man, I mean, people are still trying to get in this country because they know the opportunities that right. exist here. And it's... It's the best game in town right now. And I think a lot of Americans who were born here forget yeah, take that. Take it for granted, and right? Easily, it's just, yeah, and easily get caught up in very small things. And it's like, hey, first of all, to be born on this earth, you kind of won the genetic lottery. To be born in the United States, that's a separate type of lottery that you've won. And to be born here with basically a golden ticket, take advantage of it. Don't, you know, don't say, oh, it's too hard because, you know, there's there's some kid in, you know, the Central Africa that will never be given this chance. Right. And uh, but again, that's my military perspective. I mean, I've seen what poverty really looks mm -hmm. like and and it's not pretty. And but the people will still smile. The people will still work hard. The people will do a whole bunch of things. And I'm just like we need to have that same work ethic here. I agree. And on that note, <laughs> I would like to thank you for the conversation. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, thank you. This was great. Thank you so much.